continue our discussion of the nature of the scriptures, of the Bible itself, let's talk about three more this morning. The first is going to sound remarkably close to what we talked about in the last video, inerrancy. This idea, this doctrine, is what is referred to as the infallibility of Scripture. How do they differ? Inerrancy speaks of the idea that the Bible is without error of any sort, that it's free from error. Infallibility speaks to the opposite side of that same coin, to the truthfulness of Scripture. That is, the Bible not only doesn't make mistakes, it always tells us the truth. It may not tell us everything we wished to know, but it never tells us anything other than what is true. Let's look at John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them, Jesus prays, in the truth. Your word is truth. Now notice the way that is phrased. John did not record Jesus' words as your word is truthful, an adjective. He said that your word is Truth, a noun. It is the embodiment of truth itself. It's not all truth, but it is all true. Now, that's hard to swallow for many people living in our age. There's all kinds of competing views of what is true or truth. For example, pragmatism argues that truth is what works. And very often, people at church resort to that. Oh, we must do that because it works. Just because it works doesn't mean it's right. Existentialism is another approach that maybe you're not familiar with. Their argument is, truth is what is. It is what it is, you've heard somebody say. And so, because it exists, it must be true. Well, sin exists, but that doesn't mean that's what we ought to adhere to and follow. And then, of course, in the last 30 or 40, 50 years, another philosophy has arisen in the West called postmodernism. You might know it as relativism. The idea here is that truth is individual. Well, that may be true for you. That's not true for me. The argument is, and they state it quite clearly, that there is no such thing as except or no such thing as universal truth. Problem is, that statement is, guess what? A statement of universal truth. But Christians believe that the Bible is truth, that what it says is the truth, and we must believe it and adhere to it. And so we have to ask questions like, can any modern or new discovery contradict the Bible? And the answer is no, not if the Bible is truth. We also need to acknowledge if the Bible is truth, all other forms of truth, other sources of truth must bow to Scripture. You've heard somebody say all truth is God's truth. That is true. But how do we know that those other things are true? We compare them to the standard of truth, Scripture. So we're thinking about infallibility. The Bible is not only without error, it is also truth. We also need to think about the authority of Scripture. In what way does the Bible have authority over us? Well, authority depends on infallibility and inerrancy. Here's the way the argument goes. All the words are God's word. And so when God speaks, he doesn't speak with error. He speaks with truth. And therefore, what he said must apply. Doesn't mean that every word was spoken by God. We know that there are quotes in the scriptures from pagan philosophers. Paul, in Acts chapter 17, quotes pagan poetry. But there are many, many examples where the authors clearly say, Thus saith the Lord. In fact, there are hundreds of times that the authors claim to be speaking directly for God. That what I'm saying is what God says. Even when Moses goes up on the mountain and he hears from God, he comes back and he tells the people what God said. And then the very next verse, it says, and I wrote down everything God said. And so Moses is claiming equality between God's spoken word and his written word because it is God's word. And so thus saith the Lord, whether it's a direct quote or it's a summary of something God has said, as long as it's inspired by God, it reflects the image of God and God's character in terms of infallibility inerrancy and authority. And then many other times, of course, you've got direct cases of people claiming to speak for God. You've got the prophets or the apostles. Write these down. Look up a few of them for yourself. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 18. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 7. Or the verse we looked at a few weeks ago now, 2 Timothy 3, 16, where he says, all scripture is God breathed. It all comes from God. When we get, come to the end of the day, ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that confirms that the Bible is God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, 
Or think of Jesus in the great shepherd passage or the good shepherd passage in John chapter 10, where Jesus says in verse 27, the sheep know the shepherd's voice. They hear it and they follow it as authoritative because they know it is the shepherd himself. And so we've got infallibility this morning. We've got the idea of authority. One other area that may be one that you might want to debate about is the question of clarity. Let's admit, there are times the Bible can be difficult to understand. Different genres are read different way. Historical context is important, and oftentimes we don't know what exactly was going on. Even with familiarity, it can be a difficult thing. Peter once said of Paul that he was hard to understand. But flip side is, we know from the scriptures, if it is inspired by God because it's a revelation of God, God wants to be known. Thus, the Bible is meant to be read. It's meant to be understood, even if that might mean hard work for you as the reader. And so clarity, too, speaks of the Bible's nature. It is understandable within certain limitations, of course. Now, it's wonderful the way theologians sometimes work. We sometimes come up with really difficult words that explain simple concepts, <clears throat> right? You talk about somebody who cannot speak well has a speech impediment. We use a word they can barely say to say they can barely say words. Same thing here. Sometimes we speak of clarity by calling it perspicuity. It's a fancy word that means clarity. And so let's move on with the idea of clarity. The Bible testifies to its own clarity. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, commands us to teach our children. Now, if we're commanded to teach children, the assumption is that the children are able to understand. We're told by the scriptures that we're expected to think deeply about the scriptures. Psalm chapter 1, verse 2. Even this simple, the Bible says, can understand difficult things. Psalm 19, verse 7, or Psalm 119, verse 130. Thus, Jesus can rightly assume that we're reading the Bible and understanding it in Matthew chapter 12, verses 3 and 5. Paul, when he writes the letters, doesn't write the letters just to the elders. He writes them to the church. They're meant to be read aloud to the congregation. Colossians 4.16 says that directly. Thus, the letters were meant to be understood by the church. You can find Paul testifying to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Over and over, it was clear that they were meant to read these words and understand them. Now, some people want to complain, oh, well, they knew what was going on because they lived back then. The recipients, let's just say it up front here, the recipients of the New Testament, and arguably the Old Testament as well, but let's think about the New Testament church. Those recipients of those letters that Paul wrote or Peter wrote or James wrote, they don't have or didn't have some sort of advantage that you don't. Remember, most of them in the New Testament era were Gentiles with absolutely no biblical upbringing or background at all. They bringing nothing to the table except spiritual ignorance, and yet they're expected to read and understand. Now, there are some abilities we've got to bring to the table when we try to understand the Bible. There are intellectual abilities, Nehemiah 8, verses 2 and 3. There are spiritual abilities, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, or... 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, where it talks about the things are God or foolishness to those who are perishing, but life to those who believe. You've got to bring a moral attitude to Scripture. That is, you must be willing to follow what it says. I mean, if not, why read it at all? Which probably is why so few Christians actually seem to read Scripture. And we've got to also admit that to rightly understand Scripture requires a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. James says in James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, If any of you lack wisdom, ask, and the Spirit will give it to you. And so we are to read the Bible. We are to study it. And here's the hope. Here's the promise, the word of encouragement. When we do so, we can understand it. We won't understand it perfectly. We won't understand everything. Thus, it's a living book. We keep reading and we keep discovering new things every time we read. That's why I encourage you to read through the Bible every year of your life. Dig deeply, you know, pick a book, study it intensely, but make sure you're reading all of Scripture. It's all inspired by God. It's all written so that it might be clear. It's all written so that it might be authoritative over your life. It's all written in such a way that what you're reading is the truth in without error. It's God's Word. It'll be like Him, and He uses us 
to make us like him as well.